Okay, we're recording and now we're going to start. So welcome everybody. We're just waiting for all the attendees to join. So we'll give a little time while I watch the um, count going up and um, then once everyone's in, we will start. There we go. So we're just heading up to about 100 people joining us at the start. So let's make a start there. Welcome everybody to the Thursday evening Lien Psychiatry webinar on the 8th of October. Um, this week we're talking about sports psychiatry. I'll just do some introductions and then we'll hand over to our speakers. So first I'll just introduce the um, organising committee. My name is Alex Thompson. I'm a consultant and psychiatrist at Norfolk Park Hospital. Um, I helped to organise this by Dr Emma McAllister, who's the um, lived experience representative for the Royal College of Psychiatrists liaison psychiatry faculty, um, Dr. Shemi Shetty, who's a foundation doctor in paediatrics at Norfolk Park Hospital, and uh, Dr. Joel Richardson, who is co-chairing this evening and is a foundation doctor in emergency medicine at St. Mary's Hospital. So the format for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, we're going to have three speakers, um, 10 minutes each, followed by a Q&I session. Um, we can't see or hear from any of the audience, but we're really keen to um, hear from you in other ways. So what we'd like to do is, first of all, if you can find the chat section um, and select um, the option to chat to all panellists and attendees, um, it'd be great to just uh, you know, put your name and where you're connecting from and say hello in the chat. And please do comment um, on the, the topics of the talk while, we're, while you're listening to the talk. We have a Q&A section as well, which you can find, and we will prioritise questions that are typed into the Q&A section. Um, if you see someone else has asked an interesting question, you can vote it up with a, a thumbs up, and um, then we will pose your questions to the, the speakers. We'll finish at 8pm. <coughs> so now to introduce the speakers, um, we've got three speakers. Dr. Amit Mystery, who is the chair of the Royal College of Psychiatrists Sport and Exercise Psychiatry Special Interest Group, um, a psychiatrist in eating disorders and um, a sports and exercise psychiatry based in Oxford. Um, then we've got Dr. Thomas McCabe, who is a higher trainee in old age psychiatry based in Glasgow. Um, with a special interest in sports psychiatry and uh, long-term outcomes in contact sports. And um, our third speaker is Dr. Emily Todd. Um, Dr. Todd is a um, ST1 doctor in paediatrics based in London um, and is also um, an athlete herself, having competed, um, represented Great Britain at the Commonwealth Games and the World Juniors in the past. So um, while you're listening to the talks it it's interesting to maybe have a bit of discussion in the chat as well um i'd be really interested to hear from our audience how many people do have an interest or a clinical practice in sports and exercise psychiatry um if you're not specialized in this area then um what experience do you have of um this area and um you know, what interest do you have in the, um, you know, the, particularly the sports and exercise psychiatry special interest group? Please do keep comments general. Um, this is a large public webinar. And so please don't share details of any individual clinical cases that you've come across, um, but would be really interested to hear about your um, interest in this area. So now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Mystery, our first speaker. If you can just unmute. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name's Amit Mystery. Um, so I'm based in Oxford, health uh, consultant in eating disorders and chairing our SEPSEG. 
Um, I was told the brief would have been formal, so it's really liberating being in a t-shirt. I've never done that for a college uh, meeting, so thank you for that. It's, it, it does feel really good. Um, let's go into the next slide. Um, what, what I'm going to do is um, just give you a little background into how I got involved with sports psychiatry. And um, I do apologise to people who've, who know me and I've spoken before, because I, I do tend to repeat this, but I think it's quite nice for the context in terms of how um, as a trainee, I got involved with sports psychiatry. So around 2015, um, I'd taken a bit of time out of um, core training, was in Australia, and um, came back in 2016. And Prof Alan Curry, who may be on the call this evening, who's also in the pitch with me with Lynn Drummond at the top, um, had set up the SEPSIG, so late 2016. And essentially, this was a group of uh, psychiatrists with twofold aims. So firstly, how do we advocate uh, safe levels of exercise and how do we use that as an intervention for our patients with severe mental illness? And on the flip side, how do we support athletes who we know also have mental health needs? Some of them are like generic to like you or I, but also sometimes unique within the sporting context. So um, around October time, 2016, I was there as a fresh face in a CT3, ST4, and was just exposed to other psychiatrists who had the same interests as me. So for me, it was a real eye-opener, and I've, I, in my opinion, I think I've really thrived in that group because um, I've, I've just been, you know, really, um, I've enjoyed it so much. And through these types of um, committees and groups, being part of SEPSIG, it got me involved with Public Health England, thinking about how do we advocate exercise and severe mental illness. And um, eventually we've, we've gone to do lots of work together in terms of publications and books, which we'll kind of touch on later on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a brief history again, so from 2016, um, initially we, we started out with about 12, 16 members um, coming to the, the initial meetings, uh, lots of hard work from Prof Curry and Alan Johnston getting us going, and slowly over time we've just been expanding, so I think uh, earlier this year we've now got over a thousand members, uh, we have the highest turnout when it comes to like, elections, um, and we've got developing work streams, and I think we've got a real um, kind of bubbling group of psychiatrists who are really keen on this novel area of psychiatry. So just off the top of my head, if we think about work streams, we've got people who are keen on policy, people are advocating for exercise, um, think about how do we expand our education, uh, research, dancer mental health. We've got real different streams and we're now slowly developing um, psychiatrists who are developing their own expertise in these areas. So it's a genuine um, exciting group to be part of. And if you do want to get involved, please do get in touch. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just on that note as well, in terms of how I initially got involved, um, if you are all on the CPD online uh, with the college, um, I'd highly recommend that you check out Sports Psychiatry, uh, which was um, a module developed by Prof Curry and Prof Steve Peters. Um, again, two people who I highly regard when it comes to sports psychiatry. There's actually Steve Peters' book, uh, Chimp Paradox, which you may have heard of, which I started reading as a CT1 and just was, was fascinated by it all. So I'd really recommend um, doing that module if you haven't done that. And then in 2018, I co-authored the physical activity one with Dr. Lynn Drummond, who is an OCD specialist in South London. And again, this was, um, both have been quite well received and we, we get a lot of interest in, in doing these modules and we're gonna be updating them uh, quite soon as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you are interested, um, and this in itself is a demonstration of how much things have progressed in the space of four years, um, you know, the International, uh, International Olympic Commission have been leaders in developing the guidelines and the evidence base. They're going to have a mental health diploma coming out soon. There's now consensus papers, two of which, um, sorry, um, which were then part of um, two editions in, in BGSM last year. So two editions entirely dedicated to elite athlete mental health. Um, IOC have just released a screening tool. So for sports medics and other sports physicians on the front line, if they're worried about an athlete's mental health, they, we, have, we now have the tools to say, this is what you should be doing, whether it's just at the triage stage or the assessment stage. And then based on those results, you'd then see a sports psychiatrist or clinical psychologist, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and again, RC Psych, um, if you go on the website on our SEPSIG page, you'll see some of the work that we've been doing. And also, if anybody on the call is a BASM member, so British Association of Sports and Exercise Medicine, uh, we recently uh, guest edited 
um, their edition, and that was focused on athlete mental health and the challenges that they face. So I'd recommend reading that if, if you want to get more involved. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of my interests, um, which um, I initially got involved with sepsic, was using exercise as a therapeutic tool when it comes to severe mental illness. And the evidence base from 2015, we think of Philippe Schupp with that large meta-analysis that it did, which basically showed that it's robust, it's a good antidepressant, it just works as well as exercise. However, we do have to be careful that when patients are experiencing severe depression, exercise may not be realistic, you know, because of motivation and energy levels. But it was something that I was, um, you know, really advocating and really enjoyed. Um, what was um, a big moment for me is when I was an ST6, I then did an inpatient job in eating disorders because I always had an interest in it and I really wanted to do the job. And it's a real important uh, learning lesson for me because I, I, I realized that we've got to be really careful in terms of how we talk about exercise and how we can't be applying blanket rules when we talk about exercise because we know that it can be really dangerous, especially when we think about secondary exercise addictions for those who have eating disorders. So. Um, that's something which I, I really love exploring, uh, whether it's through the, the research or writing articles or seeing patients uh, that I see in clinic. And essentially this um, spectrum just kind of uh, demonstrates how it is such a broad spectrum in that when sometimes, you know, very topical at the moment, we can talk about being overweight and obesity, and we can talk about using exercise as a therapeutic intervention. But we do know that over time, it can form... Um, a significant part of somebody's identity and people come over invested in that exercise identity and that then can become a problem in itself all the way through to an exercise addiction which can be akin to substance misuse and kind of have you know severe physical health consequences and mental health consequences for the patients that we see uh, next slide please um, and I mentioned briefly, so IOC um, released a tool very recently, uh, Prof Curry, who is our founding uh, chair has been heavily involved with this and hopefully is, is on the call today if you've got any further uh, questions on that. But I think this is, this is a massive step uh, for us as psychiatrists. If we want to be seen as um, you know, frontline clinicians working in sports and in a sports mental health and going past the point where um, you know, there is severe distress and there needs to be early intervention, um, I think these types of tools are there so that we can intervene early um, and, and can support teams who have athletes who have severe mental illness. And we'll just touch on briefly on, on the protocol on the next slide. So I'm just mindful of time, but I think just to keep it really brief, essentially what they've done is they've done a three-stage process. So they're talking about the triage point and they're using a validated tool, which is the Athletic Psychological Strain Questionnaire. It's like it scales, uh, it goes up to 50. And if anybody scores above 17, um, that then triggers um, a further assessment. So they have, we've, the IOC have developed certain screening tools. So the common types of psychiatric problems we may see in athletes. So we can think about depression, so PHQ-9, anxiety, GAD-7. Um, they have the better Q, which is a brief eating disorders in sport questionnaire. Um, the limitation is it's mainly based on female athletes and it's mainly white Caucasian populations. And it doesn't really look into male eating disorders. And that in itself is a different kettle of fish. If you think about um, in terms of muscle dysmorphia, and the obsession with being lean and you know, terms like being jacked and ripped, which is totally different. Um, and then other tools, thinking about insomnia um, and also thinking about substance misuse, so alcohol and other types of substances. So in essence, if, the, if these screening tools are being used and are coming back as high risk or concerning, that's where the tool is recommending that the gold standard being a face-to-face -face review with a clinician uh, should be done. If these screening tools are not warrant any concerns, then it's more about the psychoeducation, whether that's going to be you know, guided self-help, you know, mindfulness, meditation, whatever forms. I think it's a nice holistic way of working in terms of we know that if things need to be escalated, we can do that uh, using this tool. And what the tool is advising is that this should be done pre-competition, so a few weeks or months before formal training and competition takes place, or if there's a major transition in an athlete's um, season. So for example, it may be a major stressor, so maybe financial or maybe um, a, um, a difficult career transition, so it might be injury, um, it might be a breakdown in terms of, you know, with their partners, etc. Um, so th this is when it should be used. And one thing that is also 
quite impressive with the IOC tool is that they've also developed one for the athlete's entourage. So whether that's a family member or a close friend, it's just talking about what are the um, red flags in terms of um, what family members need to be looking out for if they're concerned about an athlete's mental health. Um, so very quick snapshot, but that's where we're at in terms of big movements uh, this year. Who's going to the next slide, please, Alex? And I think it's a really interesting point. So all the um, conference we've had, we've had a wide MDT. So we've had sport uh, medics, psychologists, dietitians, a real mix of an MDT. And the common situation that we have, which again, we all experience in frontline psychiatry is, you know, differential diagnoses and sometimes um, the primary clinician's background having an undue influence on, on the diagnosis. And it's really interesting when we're thinking about conditions like depression and comparing that to overtraining syndrome, because often um, the um, symptoms in overtraining syndrome overlap with depression. So anhedonia, lack of energy, lack of concentration. Um, so this and how this interacts with performance is really interesting. So that's something to be mindful of if you're coming across this. Um, the second one is anxiety and performance. So if you all go back to medical school and think about the yerkes dodson curve, I think about peak performance, it's good to have a little bit of stress. If you're going to do this assessment pre-competition, everybody's going to come back really high on, on these types of scales. So it's knowing when to apply these scales and knowing when is this dysfunctional outside of the athlete's occupation and outside of their context and, and function. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about post-concussion because we've got Dr. McCabe who will be talking more about um, this, but again, it's a very interesting concept in that it's readily accepted that post-concussion, you will get depression, you may get anxiety, but what happens when we're going past the points of two, three months, six months, and we're still having that um, you know, significant impact on a athlete's function. So very interesting for us as sports psychiatrists in terms of how we get involved in these conversations. And when there is a differential diagnosis that needs to be explored, uh, we should be there um, getting involved too. Um, next slide, uh, please. Um, so this is my plug. Uh, this is where uh, Tom and I, as our um, vested interests as co-editors, along with Alan Curry, um, talk about our books. You might be able to see it. It's a case studies in sports psychiatry, um, something that we're quite proud of. So Tom and I did this as registrars. Um, and the way I saw this two, three years ago was that I was really passionate about sports psychiatry, but I didn't know enough about it. Um, I wanted to collaborate with the sports psychiatrists, sports medics, and athletes who have lived experience you know, on that frontline setting. So um, all the pictures you see are the athletes who got involved with us, who are professional athletes, um, and something that we had a lot of fun doing. And we've had a really good response, and we're looking to do more work in the future. So if you are interested, um, you know, I'd rec obviously I, I am going to recommend it, but there's lots of the texts out there um, you know, on that Asepsic website as well. So please do go on the SEBSIG resource and you'll see some of the work that we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So that kind of moves on really. So for me, it was just a very quick introduction just to give you a snapshot in terms of what we're doing. Um, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Tom McCabe next, who'll be talking about head injuries and contact sport and some of his interest in this area. And after that, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Todd, who uh, as we all know, is a former professional athlete and has an interest and a strong advocate in relative energy deficiency in sport and eating disorders and how we manage that um, as a psychiatrist and healthcare professional. So I'll hand over to them. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, it's just coming up to 20 past seven and we've got 145 people in the audience so far. Um, I'll, I'll move straight on, hand over to Dr. McCabe. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Tom. I am a older uh, adult uh, trainee based up in Glasgow. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to talk today about uh, contact sport outcomes um, and the path ahead for sport. Um, I'm going to rattle through um, a quick case presentation, recent developments and what the future looks like for sport. Next slide, please. So I think as Amit alluded to there, there has been a really dramatic increase um, in medical literature um, covering not only mental health aspects, 
um, in elite sport, uh, but also particularly uh, with regard to head injury in sport. So from a point of view of the actual epidemiological and prevalent studies, most of these have been self-report questionnaires based on symptomology uh, rather than diagnosis. Um, and this has equated itself um, into also the sports and exercise medicine world um, with um, relative standardization of how they treat head injury uh, pitch side um, and how they assess it looking, looking forward from there. The world of sports psychiatry certainly um, is quite hot at the moment, certainly within the UK. However, it's, I think it's fair to say it's more established within the US. Um, this particular topic um, has been highlighted um, in the headline and picture you see there, um, which is the New York Times, um, and featured um, a neuropathologist um, from Boston University um, and their neuropathological findings um, on selected um, brains of ex-NFL players. Um, it isn't the, the concept of the longer term outcomes isn't necessarily a new thing, however. Um, lawsuits um, have been really in place um, from the late 1990s through the 2000s up until the present day. Um, as with everything in law, it is quite complicated. Um, and I wouldn't say with 100% clarity that there has been payouts as such. Um, but certainly a lot of these are still ongoing um, and are vast and, you know, are just incredible sums of money. Um, the two pictures at the bottom are two tragic cases. Um, first is Kelly Caitlin, who was a cyclist um, who died from suicide um, in 2019. She medaled at the Olympics um, and unfortunately Fortunately, passed away due to um, many many issues. Beside her is a little bit closer to home is Ellie Souter, um, who was in Team G and she was a snowboarder um, and also passed away as a result of suicide. In both those cases, um, and perhaps this gives us an idea of how difficult it is learning from suicides, um, there was head injury. Um, on at least significant head injury on at least two occasions reported by family members um, in the two years before their death. Next slide, please. So this is, um, and I make no apology for a fairly basic and what I think is a fairly um, standard presentation that I've been seeing um, during my training. Um, and it's a patient called Mr. M, um, who I was involved with in a number of different settings. In the initial stages, um, in the liaison, um, moving on to inpatient care um, on a general adult ward and subsequently um, in a uh, functional old age ward and then subsequently in hospital based complex care. So Mr M is a 66 year old male who's initially admitted with a fairly typical mixed hyperactive delirium, um, secondary to presumed urinary sepsis and polypharmacy. Um, the collateral, um, I think, with these patients is particularly important, and his wife claimed that it just hadn't been right for months, um, and I couldn't put up with them much more, and that's certainly a phrase um, that I think we, 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 commonly, we commonly see, where families can't necessarily put a finger on what exactly they're seeing, but uh, digging a little bit deeper, uh, in this case, it meant, of course, enough personality over five years um, and there was a, quite a vagueity ar around the presentation. Importantly for Mr M, um, he had a background of being a retired bouncer, um, some alcohol history, low level anxiety and depression dealt with by the his general practitioner uh, and importantly history in contact sport not only in boxing um, but in football as well. Just commenting on the collateral a little bit further, in the five years prior to admission, um, the patient was reported, um, the first notable symptoms were reported as being mild coordination, associated impairment um, of visuospatial awareness, um, leading them to frequently bump into things. Um, following the onset of symptoms, um, there was a deterioration in, in his speech content, I with the fairly typical word finding, difficulty, hesitancy, um, and this subsequently you know, progressed over years for a fairly limited vocabulary at the time of presentation. He was also described as having a somewhat flat effect. 
in the three years before admission, um, he was seen in an outpatient clinic um, and with a score of 82 out of 100 um, in his um, ACER, um, as well as managing to maintain his function, giving him a diagnosis at that stage of MCI. He was subsequently discharged um, and his presentation um, under the medics um, subsequently came about. Um, progress on the ward was not particularly good. Um, he was treated relatively aggressively by way of benzodiazepines, a number of different antipsychotics, but wouldn't particularly settle down. This led to him having quite close nursing supervision. Um, but in essence, whenever anyone went, uh, any of the nursing staff went to carry out personal care, um, not a massive surprise that um, he punched nursing staff during personal care, and this led a fairly typical um, escalation. Next slide, please. So certainly his blood's normalized in a couple of weeks um, after admission. Um, by way of treating by way of, of obviously antibiotics. However, his uh, challenging behaviours did not. Um, there was persistent tachycardia, likely secondary to previous cardiovascular disease, but also probably antipsychotic use. Um, and unfortunately for him, he initially his mental state was of a relatively robust, large man with massive spade hands. Um, but it, it was really quite, quite sad to see over weeks and months um, where, where his weight dropped off. Um, and indeed, as he progressed um, through the various wards, um, didn't um, rally as we would have expected to treating the, the, the perceived delirium quite um, aggressively. Um, in terms of his imaging, the CT showed little to assist with diagnosis. Looking back on this case, I would have been um, particularly interested in looking at the hippocampus and the midline structures. Um, the MRI showed a standard um, small vessel disease um, and SPEC scan was negative. Um, over a period of, so eventually after four to five months, um, he was admitted to hospital-based complex care, um, non-responsive to medication, but partially responsive to um, fairly unique and innovative um, social interventions, um, i.e. one of the nursing staff um, was also a boxer, um, brought in some um, boxing gloves um, and actually for approximately half an hour a day would do some sparring which would certainly take the edge off a lot of behaviours that we saw and indeed were far more successful in treating the behaviours that we were seeing rather than um, antipsychotic medication. Unfortunately, Mr. M um, passed away um, due to infection a short time after admission, or a, a short time after admission to the hospital complex care ward. Next slide, please. I think a lot of my reflection in and around that case were the, the more frequently um, I was seeing presentations like this, um, the complexities involved in coordinating um, care for um, patients um, with a history of contact sport, um, both in the hospital setting and indeed at home. Um, I didn't think antipsychotics were, were particularly effective. Um, and it kept coming back that family were inquiring um, had this history of contact sport led to the presentation um, and actually questioning, you know, the, the consequences of that. Unfortunately, you know, I think it was it was speculation to to say that it that it had or hadn't, um, and and that was a real source of frustration um, for myself. Next slide, please, Alex. So to give you a little bit of history um, around um, CTE, so that's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and in little more than a decade, the term CT has uh, emerged into the public uh, consciousness via intense media coverage. The issue has even spawned numerous documentaries on the subject of movies um, with the neuropathologist as the chief protagonist. The media attention has helped to increase awareness of an important public health concern. Um, however, has often included inaccurate and confusing descriptions of the fundamental aspects of CTE, 
thereby causing undue alarm. For example, news stories um, have implied a link between suicide um, and brain pathologies in former athletes. And indeed, the narrative really in the US is at, at the minute is contact sport, aggression, agitation, um, suicide, and um, post-mortem showing CTE changes. Other reports, however, suggest that degenerative brain disease is almost inevitable for these sports participants, but the actual incidence of CTE remains unknown as things stand. Um, currently, a consensus criteria from a neuropathological point of view um, has been um, postulated in around two, 2017 by Anne McKee um, et al, um, based out of the Boston University. Um, however, um, this is based on a relatively small amount of patient or selected cases, um, and it would only be presumed to be preliminary as a result. As a consequence, um, many claims about the clinical and pathological features of CT continue to confuse not only the general public, but also healthcare professionals. So to bring us back to the start, next slide, please. Sorry, Alex. So um, in 1928, um, Mortland first described the chronic neuropsychiatric circuitle, um of boxing as the punch drunk syndrome, um, which I always sort of kind of visualize, not necessarily um, of how we would view it now, but rather of a boxer with very wobbly legs, staggering um, around um, a rather old looking um, boxing ring. Um, multiple subsequent reports have elaborated on these early observations and generated a somewhat consistent and characteristic clinical picture, uh, which included not only psychiatric symptoms, um, but personality changes, memory impairment, uh, pyramidal and extra pyramidal signs. Um, Things progressed through the decades and possibly the next um, landmark paper came in and around the early 2000s when Amalu, um, a Nigerian neuropathologist based in the US, described a case, stated, a case series um, of retired NFL um, footballers who had ended up um, dying as a result of suicide um, and had CTE changes on their brain. Um, so despite this long experience with dementia pugilistica, it has now been uh, subsumed into CTE, a clinical entity that is more encompassing, um, but is also more vague um, and has added to the problem um, of misunderstanding and controversy. So um, in front of us, we will see um, some um, neuro or some pathology slides um, with CTE. Um, so predominantly what we would be looking at here is aggregates and accumulation of patchy um, beta phosphorylated tau around the small vessels, um, mostly around the sulcal cortis with the uh, um, seen more commonly um, in and around the hippocampus and also the median temporal lobe. So to bring a little bit of clarity um, with regards to this whole picture, um, I have had the, the pleasure of being part of some um, uh, studies, including the field study, which is based up here in Glasgow, um, which is um, a study looking into the long-term effects of retired footballers. Um, the first study um, was quite, um, had lots of headlines um, and, and indeed showed that um, from our cohort of patients which were matched for BMI um, and for socioeconomic um, demographic, it showed that Alzheimer's was a relative risk of 3.5. Looking at the data even further, um, we looked at um, hospitalization um, of our cohort of patients, which were matched three to one uh, with the general population um, and showed lower levels um, of admission to hospital for the most common um, mental health disorders, such as depression, anxiety, addictions, um, affective disorders. What it also interestingly showed um, that there was a much less uh, rate of suicide um, when compared with the general population. Next slide, please. 
So um, what exactly are sport doing about this? Well, various administrations and authorities have attacked it in different ways. Cricket, for example, um, any of the cricket watcher or if any of your cricket watchers, you will know that um, there is a uh, brief assessment done after any time any batsman is hit on the head um, and helmets are changed as a matter of fact. Um, other sports have found things slightly more difficult. If there's anybody who's been watching the Giro d'Italia or indeed the Tour de France over the past month or so, um, without wanting to be too dramatic, it's been absolute carnage. Um, there has been uh, cyclists coming off their bikes, having quite clear fencing responses um, and essentially being patted on the head in the middle of the Alps and put back onto their bikes. Um, a sport which has looked at things and managed, managed to implement change um, a little bit further has been rugby. Um, so this, is, this was a paper in the BJSM, um, which was published, I think, um, I think it was two years ago now. Um, very quickly, it was a study on championship rugby players, so that's almost the second tier, still a professional um, a professional level, um, and they kept the uh, normal rugby rules, if you like, for the league, but in their cup competition, um, they introduced uh, rules by where um, they essentially reduced the tackle height into the laws from the shoulder to the armpits, i.e. reducing the height. Um, and this results of this most definitely did show that um, players were lower going into contact. Um, there, were in, there was lower initial head and neck contact. However, um, the concussion rates for the tackler uh, rather than the person who was being tackled uh, were actually higher um, with a relative risk of 1.9. Um, so therefore the study had to be uh, pulled relatively quickly. Next slide, please, Alex. So in conclusion, um, sporting administrations are still struggling to um, really work out ways of reducing head contacts. Um, there's clues, I think, in the medical literature at the moment to say um, that the long-term outcomes are not good. Um, clinically on the ground, these patients, when they present late, um, are challenging to deal with. Um, and there is a lot more room for research to help give us clues on how to best deal with and prevent sequelae of head contact. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so please do um, put questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll also pick up some questions, really interesting themes coming out of the chat as well. Um, but now it's just coming up to um, 7.40. Um, we've still got 151 um, attendees in the audience. So I'll hand over to our next and final speaker, Dr. Todd. Hello everyone, um, great to see so many runners talking about running in the chat box, so good to see I've got everyone interested in the best sport there is. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about, about eating disorders in sport, next slide please. Um, as Alex said before, I was an athlete previously and have also worked with Dr Thompson in liaison psychiatry at Northwick, so i um, interested in both areas. So the key things that I'm going to cover today and questions for you all to have a think about whilst I'm speaking um, is how an athlete's environment increases the risk of eating disorders in this group, what the links are between personality traits and eating disorders, and particularly the personality traits that we encourage in young athletes and how that may contribute to the increased risk of eating disorders. And then also how eating disorders or slightly less acutely disordered eating um, in sport may typically present. And I'm going to talk a little bit about relative energy deficiency in sport and the overlap between a, a few different conditions. Next slide, please. So this is just a slide just to reflect a little bit on my own journey in athletics um, and also to help all of you to see a bit about how the environment in which you exist as an athlete changes a lot from the moment when you start the sport to perhaps reaching a higher level. So on the left, we've clearly got me as a young athlete. So I was only 13 in that picture. It was probably one of my first sort of real competitions. 
Um, it was a stage of my life where I basically ran because I loved the freedom of it. Um, I liked trying to keep up with my two older brothers um, and it was very much a fun thing. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got me competing at the Commonwealth Games, which if I had known about in 2006, I would have said was a great achievement, but ultimately left feeling that I had failed on the day. Um, and also at that point, the environment I existed in was one where sort of fun was used as a dirty word and things weren't allowed to be done for fun and everything was very serious and you had a big support group around you um, and how that kind of changed the environment in which you existed. Um, next slide, please. So where does all of this pressure that you might feel at the kind of higher level of sport come from? Um, so these are some of the places that you can feel pressure from. Um, and I could talk about examples of these probably until the end of the day, um, but I won't bore you with all of them. I'll just run through a couple of quick examples. I think one of the important things is that family and friends do treat you differently as a sports person, and particularly as you become competing at a higher level, um, you increasingly get treated differently. And that can really isolate you in a way because you're treated differently you may be poorly understood in terms of your commitment to the sport and your lack of interest in other things that your friends may or peers may want to do and ultimately you can just feel like they don't understand me they don't get my commitment I'm different to them and then this can really lead you to be so isolated that if you do develop eating disorder or pathological behaviors you've lost that perspective or the contact with other people that might help you to bring you back and see where you've gone kind of awry a little bit. Um, just talking a bit about the support team and coaches as well. Um, I think my worst example in this is I have heard of a coach in America who bought the whole team the same size of kit because they felt that that was the size that the team should be to compete in sport. Um, so there are some terrible examples and there are some obviously much better examples of how much these people can influence um, behaviours in athletes. Um, talking back to the snowboarder, which Tom mentioned as well, um, prior to her suicide, it was also kind of discussed quite a lot that she was dropped from several different people that had funded her for a period of time. Um, and I think that as you get better in the sport, people talk about becoming professional, suddenly you've got to make money out of something that you initially did just for fun. You might have people like your parents or your family or other sponsors supporting you. And that in itself creates this huge pressure to put up with their support and also to feel that you're not letting them down um which can be something that can bring about this huge sense of failure if things don't go right it's not just you that's involved anymore it's also all these people who have put um effort into you social media for all of its ills um has also given us kind of unparalleled access into what your idols or what your rivals are eating what they're doing for training and can really increase this idea particularly in lots of developing athletes that i kind of helped to mentor a bit as well um, in that if I eat this way or if I train this way then I'll be as good as that person um, and you can easily forget that lots of these things should really be very individualized and I noticed there's been some interesting comments about governing bodies and safeguarding um, and again there can be huge pressure from governing bodies and a feeling that there's very much an in crowd within the governing body that you've got to get into to meet selection and things like that um, next slide please so how does all of this pressure manifest itself? So I've put in a very crude slide of a daily routine, but essentially all of these things can make it that simple tasks like going shopping with friends or going out for a meal or just sitting in the office if you're working in an office environment can become really anxiety provoking. So you don't wanna get dehydrated in case it affects your session. You don't wanna to get too hungry. You also don't wanna to eat too much before a session. So you're constantly thinking about when should you be eating? What should you be eating? How much are you drinking? Are you wearing comfortable shoes? Or are you going to get blisters? Are you sitting for too long? Are you going to be stiff? And you're kind of thinking about all these ways that these things could affect your next session in a good way or a bad way. And it makes you left feeling a bit like this lady on the right, completely overwhelmed. You can become obsessed by over preparing for all of these things. You can also become very rigid in your thinking, particularly when in athletics is a sport where people talk about you've got one chance to get it right because you're likely to peak in your kind of mid to late 20s and that can increase the pressure of feeling like I have to do everything correctly the first time around because I'm not going to get another shot at this and then you've got this obsession with doing everything correctly and in the right way. Next slide please. Um, and this is just an interesting contrast that I've seen in the last week or so. So Johnny Wilkinson, there's an interesting article in the Yorkshire Post, I thought. Um, so this is an athlete, obviously, almost the highest level that you can reach. 
with huge amounts of support around him and obviously incredibly successful. Um, and some of the things that he has said about being an athlete. So I am me and I feel that shirt was an identity that I wore, which was perfectly suited for being on the field, but came with feelings of pressure, expectation and fear of failure. And he talks about being turned into a fragile mess by wanting to believe or disbelieve how things were going to turn out instead of being empowered enough to accept that he couldn't control it. And going to bed with his worries, waking up with those worries and that shaping his whole day, which I think is something that lots of athletes do experience and increasingly are talking out about. So I just wanted to contrast this actually to um, Daniel Roden, who's pictured on the right hand side, who's obviously much lesser known, but is the recent men's 800 meter champion in Britain, um, who has a very strong religious faith um, and very rarely for an athlete talks about how it's not his control that he's got good genetics, it's not his control that he's got good opportunities, and that there are other people who with the same opportunities and genetics might run better than him. And I think that's something you almost never hear because athletes like to take ownership of their successes, they like to think it's because of the hard work that they've put in. But actually, it's a very healthy attitude that I think lots of athletes would reflect on if they were able to recognize that there were things out of their control they might have had a lot of less anxiety and fear of failure whilst they were competing next slide please so um what's the link between personality traits and eating disorders in sport and i've put a couple of questions there um which i think are interesting to think about but one of the main points of the slide is essentially you look at people like Jessica Ennis and you encourage young athletes and children to look up to these people and you look up to them because they're committed, they're determined, they have an attention to detail and these are all things that we tend to admire in people and so you have young athletes coming into athletics clubs like 11, 10 year olds and you're encouraging them to go the extra mile to complete training exactly as it's written on the schedule to do the full session and not to drop out and you're rewarding them for all of those things but by the time these athletes are 16 17 early 20s they can have become so obsessed by showing themselves to be committed and showing themselves to go the extra mile that they develop kind of obsessive behaviors so thinking about some examples of that and ways to recognize that there are so many athletes and perhaps some of the people who have got into running on this um, call who they say they're going to go for a 20 minute run and they get home, they've done a loop that they plan to do, which is normally about 20 minutes, but they get back at 19, 25. Can you stop or do you have to continue until you finish those 35 seconds and gone to complete your 20 minutes? Interesting observation. OK, so next slide, please. Um, so just quickly, I know that you were all familiar with the ICD-10 um, and I've just popped up there the definition of the anacastic personality disorder. And I think it's just interesting because I'm not saying that all athletes have a personality disorder or even nearly, but I think it's interesting to see that these traits, which can be considered pathological in some contexts, are very much the things that we reward athletes for during their development and that we praise people for them. And we're really selecting people with these traits to be sports people. Next slide, please. So I hope that that's kind of demonstrated that you've got this perfect storm of this hugely pressurized environment, which is in more and more pressurized as you reach a higher level of sport. And you've also got this group of athletes which you've selected for traits like commitment and dedication, which can sometimes run into a very obsessive end of the spectrum, which creates the perfect storm for an eating disorder or disordered eating to develop in. Next slide, please. So moving on to how eating disorders may typically present in sport. Um, next slide, please. So red S stands for relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, and I've just put a typical case study here. So 22 year old university student that increased their training recently as they go to university, they've got a new training group and they're keen to kind of reach a new level in sport. They're taking their sport a bit more seriously. In female athletes, they often lose their menstrual cycle. They get a stress fracture. And in discussions with the recovery of the stress fracture, they talk about having a rest period of about three months and they suddenly have a panic attack at the thought of that. Um, I've put two examples there, so Bobby Clay and Jess Pisaki, who have both had severe red S. Um, Bobby Clay on the left there in her mid twenties got such bad osteoporosis that she actually started sustaining spinal fractures just sitting down on the floor. So red S can be caused by unintentional or intentional underfueling. Um, and particularly in these kinds of university students who transition away from home and they may start actively traveling to training, they may be doing a lot more cycling or walking than they previously did. 
um, and often underestimate their energy needs. They may also be cooking for themselves for the first time and buying food for the first time, which again can contribute to them not quite realizing how much fuel that they need. Lots of these athletes start off with a minor dietary modification. They think, okay, well, I'm just going to pay a bit more attention to eating healthily to try and improve my performance. And then they can come become a bit obsessed by the fact that they look leaner, which they may like and become um, rewarded by. They may get compliments. So people might say, yeah, you're looking more like an athlete or, you know, you looked really good today. And then that can again spur things on. They might start to treat themselves, so only giving themselves sweet things if they've had a good session and then become a bit um, addicted to that. And quite often these are the athletes, they start with these minor things and then it can develop into a full-blown eating disorder. Next point, please. Um, one of the important things to note about Red S um, is that lots of these athletes actually don't get to the point where they're losing loads of weight and develop a very low BMI. So they can hover around that area where the body has shut down almost all of their hormonal functions and prioritized activity um, and maintain weight, but have just shut down all of these other things. So the blood tests can reflect that. So you've got low TSH and low T4, low sex hormone markers and very raised um, 9 a.m. cortisol level. And just a really key point, which has become a bit of a bugbear for those of us who've been involved in Red S or had no people who've been experiencing it, um, is often the oral contraceptive pill is prescribed for female athletes as a way to kind of stimulate some kind of cycle or as a treatment for their menstrual disturbance. But it often completely masks that disturbance without actually helping their bone health, which is the big concern here. So normally temporary treatment with hormone replacement therapy is much more beneficial for their bone health whilst they address the underlying fuel imbalance. Next point, please. So finally, just to quickly um, cover the overlap between these different conditions. Um, I know that Amit's briefly mentioned exercise addiction as well. And I think it's interesting to note that there are overlapping symptoms between normal elite athlete training and exercise addiction. So normal elite athletes will experience some withdrawal symptoms if they stop, and they do obviously spend most of their time doing it, but generally don't go to the point they're causing themselves harm and generally stop once they've done what they set out to do in that session. Um, and as I touched on, we can also have secondary exercise addiction in those with eating disorders who are kind of got that compulsive um, need to exercise. And I'm also briefly mentioned overtraining syndrome, where your training load is so high that your performance suffers because you just cannot adapt between sessions because of the amount that you're doing. Um, and that can happen even if you're feeling adequately. And of course, if you've got elements of all three of these things, then you're most at risk of developing complications of Red S and all of these hormonal disturbances, most at risk of developing osteoporosis and having serious problems further down the line that can take a long time to get over. Next slide, please. So, and with the next pointer, so we've got loads of barriers to getting help in athletes, particularly because by this point, there's such a huge fear of their performance suffering by getting help or changing their behavior. And actually the routine that they've developed can be one of the things that alleviates their anxiety as we see in other mental health problems. Um, so one of the resources I'd like to draw your attention to, as well as obviously Amit and Tom's book, which I um, <laughs> led an author, a, a book chapter of, um, is Pippa Wolven's new resource, which is called Athletes in Balance. Pippa is a great friend of mine who's had a terrible time with Red S um, and taken her years to recover. Um, and if anyone's interested in the lived experience of Red S and these other related issues, then I would really highly recommend her website, which is very informative, really comprehensive um, and very interesting and also a good resource to point athletes towards. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I've left enough time for us to all have plenty of questions and an interesting discussion. Thank you all for listening. Thanks very much. And thanks to all three speakers. And uh, you've mentioned a few um, resources, um, which we will circulate to the um, attendees. Um, looks like we've uh, formed a running club as well in the chat. Uh, and um, yeah, Thomas mentioned that there's uh, already a, a sepsig um, Strava group. So um, it would be great if we can sort of forward details to everyone to um, look at joining that as we go along. Um, it's just coming up to five to eight, so we've got time for a couple of questions. And our, um, Joel, my co-chair, has been um, sort of monitoring the, the chat as, as well as the, the Q&A. And uh, I think if you can just bring out some a couple of questions, Joel, go ahead. Yeah, I'll try and prioritise. So one really interesting, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, go yeah. ahead. So one very interesting question that got a lot of interest was 
um, we're becoming very aware of kind of some high profile cases of abuse in things like sports teams, especially in the US and Canada, and kind of with abuse making people at risk of mental health and people with mental illness being also at risk, more of a risk of abuse. What is the role of sports psychiatry in safeguarding, helping people and being aware of this kind of thing? I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that first. Yeah, I think it's been um, obviously, you know, with all the media profile and the attention that you know we're getting, you know, whether it's in America or here, you know, it's very concerning. But I think we as a group, we've got good links with EIS. We have two psychiatrists who work, you know, for EIS, um, and we have um, so Dr. Lecker, who's based in Sheffield or Derbyshire, who is taking a lead within the SEPSIG um, to be working on the policies and how we can um, support with safeguarding but it is you know, it's really political and it's a very sensitive issue and I do think there is a role for psychiatry um, in, in these uh, matters just by the nature of some of our frontline work and working with risk. Um, Alan Curry is has also commented on the um, question and there's lots of good resources there um, that have been uh, mentioned so I think I'm scrolling through now and um, so like NSPCC um, their child protection in sport um, and this is something that we are keen to develop as a work stream. So this is something that uh, Kaz Narman and I um, are going to be pushing as a, a exec going forward. I think it is something that is very topical and very important uh, for us to be uh, helping out with. Yeah, I'll jump in there as well, Joel, if I may. Um, so ultimately, I think a, a lot, a lot of what has come out recently. The, the the Netflix documentary was was which his name I for, forget was was pretty traumatic. The first half, the second half of it, I suppose, was just in essentially the environment um, that the, uh, these athletes at, at the very top of uh, the world, uh, you know, exist. So they're not only as doctors do we obviously treat mental illness, but we have to prevent it. And as part of that, um, there is most definitely a role for a sports psychiatrists to cultivate. Um, a psychologically welcoming um, environment uh, within these organisations. So, so yes, there most definitely there most definitely is a role there. Anything from you, Emily? Um, I don't think so. I think it's just uh, re-emphasising again that that governing bodies can hold such a huge power over the athlete, which again is covered in these documentaries, um, and that in in the athlete, I mean, the fear of not being on the right side of the people who select you, the people who provide you with financial support, the people who provide you with all of the support systems around like physiotherapists and psychologists and all that kind of stuff. The fear of losing that is just massive and just creates a huge power imbalance that you can't really, you know, substitute in any other way. Um, we've only got time for probably one more question, but something that's come up a lot is that we know that exercise is very important for normal function. We heard from Amit how it can have, you know, a lot of health um, kind of psychological benefits, but a lot of patients in hospital, both psychiatric and medical, very limited access to actual uh, ability to do exercise or sport. Um, what can we do to kind of help that? Or what, what, what do you think is for the future going forward for that? I think it's a great question. Um, what, what we are finding is, um, especially in the new generation of psychiatrists, there's a lot of interests on how we, how we use exercise um, you know, in the mental health settings. Um, just a couple of resources for you all. If you've heard of Exercise Professionals for Mental Health, so EPMH, and also Move in Medicine, um, these are um, bodies and groups that we as a sepsic have been involved with. So um, they are free resources in terms of how you can promote exercise for our patients. And somebody in the group already made a really good point in that we, we can't be using blanket approaches when it comes to exercise it has to be tailored and we have to think about what's suitable for our patients whether that's mild moderate or vigorous activity um, whatever works for the patients and sometimes in a physical activity exercise doesn't have to be exercise it can just be physical activity and you know being practical so you know going to the shops and walking you know carrying bags you know there is a real um, diverse way of exercise and I don't think we have a kind of a standardized way of promoting that. If you are concerned about patients that we see, because a lot of our patients as we know have physical health comorbidities, um, if you go on the American College of Sports Medicine uh, website, they have a pre-participation exercise uh, protocol, it's very clear, but basically the, the, the way it works is in that if you just want to engage in mild to moderate 
physical activity, it gives you a guide on as to how you can promote that for our patients as well. So some really good resources um, out there. And if you do get stuck, again, feel free to message me. And I can definitely point you, you know, in these right directions. Thank you. Uh, anything else to add from Thomas or Emily before we finish up? No, I mean, well, I think we're at eight o'clock, Alex. So I don't know if you want to wrap up there. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think what's worth reflecting on is the diversity and, and the range of um, topics that we've covered and, and also the range of uh, applicability. This, this area, um, what's really struck me is that it applies to everybody from, uh, it's not just about elite athletes and sports people, but it's actually about daily activity and looking at how we can all consider um, you know the link between activity exercise in um, our daily lives and our mental well-being how that um, can be incorporated into both uh, mental health services and uh, the other side of um, how uh, medical services and physiotherapy and other things can better consider um, you know, mental health and uh, psychological impacts as well. Um, so um, we've had three really good, really interesting talks from three great speakers. And I just want to say thanks to all the speakers as well. And also I really want to thank all the audience for joining us as well. Um, it's been really interesting both listening to the talks and also seeing people's comments and interest in, in the, the chats as well. Um, we will circulate... Um, some certificates and uh, we'll also give you a bit of an update of the the resources and things that have been suggested as well and probably early next week um, and please do look out for future webinars as well and we've got another couple coming up in October and uh, then uh, some more in, in December after a little break um, but I'm going to thank our speakers thank our organizers and also thank you the audience as well and we'll finish up there. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.